Uh, you are welcome in Jesus' name. Um, I'm excited to uh, come to this place once again. Uh, for those of us who have seen me here before, um, I trust that you will, you will greatly be blessed in Jesus' name. Um, my brother and friend has already told you the passion of our hearts, and uh, we really want to encourage everyone in this meeting um, that God is with us. And it would bless everyone gloriously in Jesus' name. I just want us to open a few scriptures before Cain will come forward uh, to, to minister to us. Um, not because I want to preach, uh, but just to set a tune of um, some of the uh, things that we are gathered to do. Again, we want to uh, give glory to God for our host and his wife as well as the music ministers who have just ministered to us. The Lord bless you as well in the name of Jesus. Yeah, I want to just look at um, Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7. Uh, remember, I'm not preaching. I just want to, um, you know, give us some highlights of some of the issues that are very, very germane. In Exodus chapter uh, chapter 7 verse 16 it says and thou shalt say unto them the Lord God of the Hebrews had sent me unto thee saying let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness and behold hitherto thou wouldest not hear now uh, again let me repeat myself like a broken record I'm not preaching I just want to point out to you that this is the first mention of this statement let my people go that they may serve me let my people go that they may serve me um, many ministries end up in let my people go they don't add that the people may serve me and God said this through the mouth of Moses seven times very very interesting let my people go that they may serve me. If our world evangelization has uh, not so much <laughs> got to thank God for what our fathers have done, and I'm really very grateful every time I speak about it. But I want to say that there is the issue of the church of Jesus Christ to know that they're a kingdom of priests and they're supposed to go serve the Lord. I'm praying that we come to pass in this meeting in Jesus' name. In uh, a, a Psalm 80, 80, 82 or thereabout, let's look at Psalm 82. If I can't find the place, we'll just go on very quickly. Psalm 82 in verse number 5. The whole passage will be good for you later to read. He said, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. <laughs> this is the real issue for the church, that we are giants. This is true. God has made the church a giant. But if we walk without understanding the earth, the nations of the earth will remain out of course. We are supposed to set the course for the nations. But unfortunately, we have not um, put our strength together as the body of Christ. We work as denominations, we work as different groups, we work at, we worked as race, we work as black and white and, and all manner of things. But if we will put our strength together, we'll see that the earth will no longer be out of course. Adam didn't know this. Because this passage in Psalm 82 is written for Adam. He didn't know he was a giant. And he missed it somehow. 
So I pray that the church will not continue to miss it. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 7, Acts chapter, chapter 15, verse 7. Acts chapter 15, verse 7. Uh, it said, And when there had been much disputation, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Amen. That's where I'm going to end my, um, my welcome address. Um, here we are told that there was arguments in the church. And then eventually Peter rose up and then he made a statement, which is the highlight of why I'm reading the verse. He said, God made choice among us. God made choice among us. I'm praying that in this meeting, God will make choice among us who we can reach the world. Uh, we'll speak by our mouths to those who have not heard, and they shall hear through us in Jesus' name. I want to welcome again everyone, and particularly, I want us to give uh, a clap offering while we welcome Ken Anderson uh, to come and give us the opening message. Thank you very much. It's great to have this chance to be with you. Um, as was said in the introduction, I spent 20 years with Wycliffe and Bible translators. And when I was doing that, it was, I was focusing on a lot of the, the world in, in the South, Africa, Asia, Latin America, places like that, because that's where the Bible needs to be translated. And I have to say, as part of that, I went to Nigeria frequently toward the end. And part of the reason I'm focusing on Europe today is because what I saw in Nigeria. When I went to Nigeria, I saw people of faith. I saw people who prayed. I saw people who evangelized. I saw people who, whatever was going on, they thought of God first. God was big in places like Nigeria. And I worked with people who were like from South Korea. And they believed they could pray and make anything happen. And again and again, I saw that happen. And then I would come back to England. I would come back to Europe. And suddenly, where God was big in Nigeria and big in South Korea, God seemed to be really small. And it didn't seem like he could do much here. Now, obviously, God's the same. But I wanted to see the churches here having that same kind of faith and expectation that I saw in places like Nigeria. So thank you for building my faith up to want to come back and say this isn't good enough in Europe. And that's why I've switched from focusing on places like Nigeria to working with church planting in Europe. Um, I've been invited, though, to speak on mission strategy, ministering cross-culturally to rescue souls. Well, anytime I'm asked to speak on any topic, the first thing I try and ask myself is, can we look and see how Jesus did this? Because Jesus is always the best example. So what we're going to start with today is thinking about how you do cross-cultural ministry by looking up to see how Jesus did it. Tomorrow, when I'm speaking, I'm going to build on looking up to say, but we also need to look out at the people we want to reach. And we also need to look inside ourselves. We need to look in and say, how do I need to change so I can do that? But we're going to start by looking up at Jesus. Now, if we had lived when Jesus lived and we'd met him, Jesus would have looked like a normal man. He, he was Jewish. He lived in a certain place. He spoke Aramaic. He spent time with 12 men. He was a teacher who used local examples. People meeting him saw a man. But we know that Jesus wasn't like that before he came to earth. Before he was born, Jesus wasn't 
just a man. And after his resurrection, Jesus wasn't just a man. So it's an amazing thing to think about that in heaven, Jesus is God, right? With all the authority and power that that means. So you have to ask yourself, why did Jesus act like just a humble man when he was on earth? He had all that power, all that knowledge, all that authority, and he acted like you and me. Well, I'm convinced that the reason Jesus became like us was because he wanted to rescue souls which is what this conference is all about. Jesus was so driven by love that he changed so that he could be more easily understood by those people he was trying to reach. It's an amazing thing to think. We spent all of our time trying to become more supernatural and get a hold of more of the supernatural. And Jesus, who is our example, actually became less supernatural in order to reach us. Because he was so supernatural, we couldn't relate to him. And so that's the challenge when we're trying to think about cross-cultural ministry then, is sometimes we have to become like the people we're trying to reach. We have to become more like them so that they can more easily understand God's love for them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have us look through in a little bit of detail how Jesus did this, because I don't think this is something we usually think about. So the first thing I'd like to think about is the fact Jesus was local. We're so used to thinking about the Gospels gone the whole way around the world that we forget that Jesus, when he lived here as a man, probably never got more than 75 miles away from his birthplace. He walked places. He didn't go that far. I've gone much further than that today on the train to come here. I've come from London up to here, way more than 75 miles. And in fact, one of the things that drives home the fact that people were local, I'm going to pick on Peter, Peter, when he got to the stage that he denied Jesus in Matthew 26. Remember there was the stage where somebody identifies and says, you're one of them. What they say in Matthew 26, verse 73, is it says, after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them, your accent gives you away. In the UK, I can tell where people are from by their accent. If somebody's from London, I can tell. If somebody's from Cornwall, if somebody's from Manchester, I can tell by their accent. I may not be able to tell what they're saying because the accent is so strong, but I can tell where they're from because they're local. And that means the people around them say, you're one of us. And then they listen to you better. Jesus, it's weird to think about it, but Jesus probably spoke with an accent because he was local. So if we're wanting to be cross-cultural, one of the things we have to think about is the where we minister. What is it like here? Not just what it was like where I came from, what's it like here? And that leads us on to language. Now, as I said before, I used to be with Wycliffe Bible translators, so language was a big thing for us then, but Jesus, when he was in heaven, I don't think he was limited by an earthly language. I'm sure he didn't speak even Yoruba. You know, some people might argue that is heavenly language. But he, he spoke Aramaic as much as we can tell from scripture. But whereas he could have spoken any language and understood every language and had words that explain things in heaven that we can't even begin to imagine. He chose to speak one language because that was the language of the people he was trying to reach. And we know that he did it because the, the, the Gospels, which were written in Greek, have bits of Aramaic in it that have to be translated. 
So two simple examples from Mark 5, 41, when Jesus heals a little girl, it says, he took her by the hand and said to her, talitakum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Well, they wouldn't have had to translate it. This is what it means if he wasn't actually speaking that language. Another one, Mark 7, verse 34, he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, this is another thing when he's healing somebody, uh, he was a blind person, and he said with a deep sigh to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. So once again, Jesus actually spoke the local language, and that can be a challenge to us that we need to think when we're trying to reach people about what they speak. Now, it's one thing if you're in northern Nigeria and you speak Hausa. Obviously, you've got to do that as a place to start from. But you live here. You know that everybody here doesn't speak the same. Does anybody here have a teenage child? None of you have teenagers. Do teenagers speak exactly the same language you do, or do they speak some kind of mystery language part of the time? So if you're going to reach teenagers, you need to learn the way they speak, and et cetera. So we do need to think about language when we want to be cross-cultural, because it was important enough that Jesus did it. Another thing, we read these things in the Bible all the time, and we just think they're stuff Jesus did, but I'm sure he was doing it for a reason. Jesus used to go to events. So we need to think about events when we want to reach people. Two quick examples from Jesus. Again, one we remember, he, his very first miracle was done at a wedding, which is an important event in that culture. So it says, John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So Jesus it created a social structure. His mother was there. He was invited. He could bring his disciples along. His disciples could watch how he ministered and related to people and learn from that. It created an environment where he could bring God's love. And as a result, we get our first miracle. But sometimes Jesus did events that weren't always popular with the religious people. So in Matthew 2.15, we have him going to a tax collector's house. And it says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with them and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And we remember that he used to get opposition because he would go to those places. But Jesus was looking for events and opportunities that he could go interact with people. So if we want to minister cross-culturally, we need to be thinking about what are the opportunities to gather here. It doesn't do me any good to think about how people gathered in the United States, where my parents come from. I must admit, I don't really feel American. I just have the passport, nice passport to have. But for me, the U.S. is kind of a foreign country. But it doesn't do any good if I thought about the way people gather there if I'm living in the UK, because it's different. So you need to be aware of how it happens here so you can go interact with people. Another one I love is Jesus, when he taught, used examples, right, all the time. In fact, the main thing he talked about quite often was the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And he would say, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he would talk about, it's like this. And another time he'd say, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And another time he'd say, the kingdom of heaven is like this. But each example he used was something that related to the local culture and the local people understood. So it was easy for them to understand. Now, I'm going a little off on a tangent, but I was mentioning before about how Jesus limited himself to Aramaic. I think part of the reason when he wanted to talk about the kingdom of heaven, he had to do so many examples, is because there aren't words in human speak to get across how amazing the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be. So he had to keep using little pictures that gave a glimpse of it. 
and a glimpse of it and a glimpse of it. In heaven, there probably were perfect heaven words for that. You know, there might have been one word you could say that captured it all. But if he'd used that word, nobody would have understood a thing. So he used examples, which made sense. And that's why he said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Because everybody understood that. Would I use that if I was talking to a bunch of teenagers today? I might quote scripture, because I think scripture has power. But how many of them have ever really seen a shepherd? They've probably seen a sheep on TV, but they don't understand it. So sometimes we have to be thinking about what are the examples that will make spiritual concepts make sense to the people we're reaching today. We can't just copy what worked in a church that I was in 30 years ago in another country, or sometimes even in the scriptures, we have to explain what it means because it just doesn't make sense here. Another one to think about is relationships. Relationships were vital to how Jesus did ministry. And in fact, I find it amazing, but also really challenging for all of us that Jesus' long-term success plan for the growth of the church was not based on him doing it with all of his power and insight and wisdom. He chose a few people, and they weren't that perfect when he started. And he based his long-term plan on growing them, much more than on speaking to the crowds. Yes, he spoke to the crowds. When the crowds were there, he felt compassion, and he responded, and he taught them. But his plan was for those disciples to become like him and keep doing the work after he left. An example from Matthew 8:18 8, says, Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. What an amazing thought. Here's a crowd in front of him. He could speak and teach and preach and challenge them. And instead he says to the disciples, uh, let's go somewhere else. If it had been us, be honest, how many of us would have wanted to stay with the crowd? It feels good to be speaking to a crowd. It feels good because you look and you say, I could get that success I want right now if enough of them respond. And all of them want to listen to me. There's a lot of things. But Jesus had a plan based on relationships, not just numbers. I'm not putting down numbers. There's a place for it. But we have to think about how relationships fit in to our strategy if you want to do effective cross-cultural ministry because that's how Jesus did it. How did Jesus trust these few broken people, though? I think, and this is another crucial point, it's because he trusted the Holy Spirit to continue the job. Jesus knew what his part was. He was to come down and show us what God's love and character was like in a way we could understand. It was to die on the cross and be raised again to prove that he really was God's son. But it wasn't his place to then stay forever. It wasn't his place to help every Christian. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He sent the Holy Spirit. He has stayed forever. And he's in every one of our lives if we know Jesus. Sorry if I didn't point at you. And he trusted the, the Holy Spirit would deliver. Do we? If you start a ministry, you're always going to have more experience than the people you lead to the Lord because you're their spiritual father. 
If you're teaching people and discipling them, you're always going to know more Bible than they do because you're teaching them. Are you willing to say they're not done yet, but I believe the Holy Spirit is going to work in them and keep going so I don't have to hold their hand forever? And that's exactly what Jesus did. In Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, it says, Then they gathered around him, Jesus, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So very bluntly, Jesus passed on his ministry to less gifted local people. And I think that's a challenge for us to recognize it's our job to pass ministry on. So we always need to be thinking about whether or not we're actually ready to do that. So let's go back to Jesus and the whole heaven and man thing. I don't have perfect words for heaven again, so excuse me using earth words. In heaven, Jesus was powerful, right? We have no sense of how powerful, but he was powerful. He was rich. Which, with true wealth, not the stuff we wasted on here, like a BMW, which you have one accident and it's gone. Or Bitcoin, which you buy at the wrong time and it suddenly has no value. Jesus was really rich. He was glorious. He had all authority. Remember, right before he goes, he says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. But he sacrificed all of that to reach the lost. Because he gave that up when he came down as a man. He wasn't suddenly all-powerful. He suddenly wasn't having all that wealth and that glory and the authority. He chose to give that up. So he gave up position and power and wealth and instead spent years with sinners, which can't have been fun when you lived in holiness for eternity in heaven. And what did those sinners do? Well, they rejected him, and they denied him, and he eventually even died. Jesus sacrificed. Well, I'll give you another word for sacrifice. It's being uncomfortable. Jesus obviously went way beyond just being uncomfortable. But sometimes we throw the word sacrifice around, and it becomes this holy word that we don't think about. So really the question is, are we willing to become uncomfortable to reach the lost? Or do we really just want success? And that can be success in our own lives, if you're living a normal job and a normal life. If you're a church leader, it can be really tempting to want success in your church. I'm in a relatively small church plant that's not growing as fast as I'd like at the moment, and I find it really frustrating. Why? Because I want success. Yes, I want people who are lost to be saved, but I also am a little embarrassed that there's not more people there at church on Sunday morning. Am I willing to be uncomfortable to reach them? So I'm going to read two different scripture passages to help drive home to us how much change there was be, 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 by, be, between the way Jesus was in heaven and what he eventually became to reach us. This is from Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 to 17, when John sees Jesus in heaven. So this is what Jesus is like in, in heaven. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. 
the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he's placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. John, who had been for years with Jesus as a disciple, as a man, when he saw him as God, it was such a shock that he fell down as dead and was afraid, or Jesus wouldn't have said, don't be afraid. Because suddenly he saw how much Jesus was God. And I don't think we'll ever get a glimmer of what that is until we really get to heaven. But if you want to get a sense of what Jesus was like as a man, this is from Isaiah 53, 3 to 5. So this is prophecy looking forward, but this is talking about what Jesus was like as a man. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus was willing to go from having all of everything that was perfect to having eventually not even life. Why? Because he loved the lost. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? It's about love. And if we love the lost, we have to follow Jesus. And we have to be willing to sacrifice what's easy and comfortable for us. Now, I'm not telling you to stop being Nigerian. And I want to say something really, really clearly now. I want to celebrate what the African Diaspora Church is able to do, particularly here in a place like the UK, where the church doesn't grow very fast. African churches are succeeding and growing. You know how to reach Africans. All the biggest churches that I've been to are either African or have incredibly large African percentages. Jesus House, KICC, Kensington Temple, whatever. Keep it up. Do that. Every one of those people needs to come closer to God. They need to be saved or they need to be grown. Do it. But the challenge is what works for Nigerians or Ghanaians doesn't work for indigenous British people. It doesn't work for Norwegians. It doesn't work for people from the Czech Republic in the same way. That's why you look at a black church and it's black. You worship different. You teach different. You do relationships different. You do meals different. Very simple one. If you have a relationship, you expect, you know what that means? It means you get to know each other and you go in and out of each other's house, and you eat together. You do that with an English person, they get scared. If you want to do cross-cultural ministry, it's about becoming like them. And I'm going to be talking more about that tomorrow. When I talk about how do we look at them, a lot of these same principles come back, but I'm going to break them down. Because Jesus did them, that's why I'm going to talk about them, not because I like them. So we're going to need to look at them and then look into ourselves and say, but are we really ready to do this? 
has God called me to do this? Because it's not an easy thing to do. I'm going to finish up with um, a story just to encourage us, though. And I'm going to take it back to kind of what I said at the start about faith and expectation and how Nigerians blessed me, but in another context. I know a man who works with the organization I'm with, European Christian Mission, who, his name is Stephen Bell. And back when communism was still strong in Europe, he felt the Lord had laid on his heart to go work in Albania, um, which at that stage was, was part of one of the Soviet republics. And um, there was no way to get in as a missionary, so he went in as a student and was studying the local language and all that kind of stuff, trying to get ready. And then communism fell. And he already had language. He was on the first kind of bus van of actual missionaries who went into the country. Um, and right then at that moment, it was a lovely time because people had been told they couldn't be religious for you know, very long time. And people said, we can do this again. And suddenly so many people came to Christ and they couldn't keep up with the churches that were being planted. He was just, day after day, he would drive to this church and speak and this church and speak and this church and speak and all that kind of stuff. And it, it was a lovely time when the church just exploded in that special moment. Then once it got to the stage enough, Albanians were kind of working that it worked. He said, okay, I need to go on to another country. And he moved next door to Croatia. Problem was, when he got to Croatia, it was several years on from communism falling and everybody being excited. And that wonderful, oh, this is new, had gone away. People were hard again. Um, and whereas churches had grown and started, particularly blaming my own country, through American money being poured in, and so they built big churches and thought they would be able to keep going, and then the American churches went, oh, there's something else more exciting going on, and started giving money someplace else, and they were left with infrastructure they couldn't afford and things. So the church was a little jaded. It, it, they, they, they didn't know how to keep up with the expenses they had. People weren't coming to Christ. Pastors got discouraged. That's when Stephen shows up in Croatia. And he, and he looked around and he went, no one's expecting God to do anything. Because they had just gotten discouraged. They were still holding church services. But people weren't getting saved and new churches weren't being planted. So he decided the primary thing he needed to do was bring faith. Help them have expectations. And some of that was because he helped plant a church and it worked and things. But what he did is he looked around the world and he said, where are there people in other parts of the world who believe God's going to do stuff? And one of the big places he'd seen that was, was Brazil. So he said to me, why don't we bring Brazilians across and show that God can do stuff? And, and I kind of looked at Stephen because I'd been trained how to think about missions when I was with Wycliffe and it was all about culture and language and stuff. And I went, Brazilians won't work in Croatia. There's nothing that, that, that matches up. The languages don't relate. The cultures don't relate. Stephen says, yeah, yeah, the faith will work. And I went, okay. So he started bringing Brazilians across. And the first, he brought a, some short-termers. They came for about a year because you have to test and see if these things work. And one of the first stories you told me about it was they, was they arrived and they took them out for pizza. Not a particularly deep ministry thing, but took them out to have pizza. And it was like 11 o'clock at night or something because they're Croatian. And um, they wanted to pray for their pizza, so, but they weren't sure if they could do that. So one of the Brazilians walks up to the guy who owns the restaurant and says, can we pray for our food? And the guy goes, well, of course you can pray for your food. So they prayed for everybody's food. They stood up and they prayed for all the food in the restaurant and, kind of, and, and suddenly, because they looked so different, everyone in Croatia is white. There's like no ethnic diversity almost at all. Everybody knew these Brazilians had come in and they all got noticed 
and they started building relationships and they started having success and other churches suddenly were looking and going, oh, can we have Brazilians? Can we have, can you get some more of them to come work with us? And quite a few churches got planted. Has there been revival? No. Has there been success? Yes. And it's reached the stage now that the leaders, you were talking, someone was mentioning before about denominations and do we work together? Because they've built a bit of excitement, they've been able to invite the leaders of all the different denominations and the different groups like that to come together and say, how's it really going in our country? And they all got together and said, well, how many churches have you planted in your denomination or your denomination or yours? And they realized that in the previous year in the entire country, there had been, I think, five churches planted. And they looked at each other and they said, this isn't good enough. We can't let this go on like this. Before, that had been normal and no one was bothered. But now they'd seen it could be different. And they said, no, no, we've got to change this. And now they're working on a strategy to reach the country together and cooperate and identify where ministry needs to go on. Why? Because somebody said, we need faith. Let's bring people in who have faith. So, yes, we're going to look more tomorrow about some of the details, but I want to underline you are bringing something to the UK that Europe needs. You are bringing faith. Yes, I'll talk about details of how stuff is done. Don't lose the faith. Everything else is detail. Keep that going. And whether you do it in a Nigerian style, or a British style, or your style, or whatever it is, keep that up, because everything happens from faith. Why? Because faith is when we let God break into this world. And God wants to break into this world. Our faith is just opening the door for God to do what he wants to do anyway. We're lining up with him. And you have the opportunity to do that in your life, in this church, in all the different churches that are here. And I look forward to speaking about this tomorrow in more detail. And who do I hand the microphone to? While I wait for whoever comes up to take the microphone, I want to pray for you. Because I have faith. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each one of these people that are sitting here. Lord, I don't know them, but you've been with them every moment of their life. And you're going to be with them every moment of the rest of their life. And you're going to be with them every moment of eternity, which is the amazing bit. But Lord, between now until they die or you come to take them, you're going to be making them more like you. So I pray that these people here, even this weekend, will feel stuff happen that draws them more to you and inspires them to want to be more like you, such that your love is overpowering and can't be contained in them. And they have to tell people about Jesus and they have to draw them to you. And I pray that this weekend will be the start of that happening even more. Lord, touch our hearts. Pour the Holy Spirit in. Don't let all the stuff that stopped us in the past stop us again. Break through and do more, Lord. Numbers don't matter. What matters is the size of you. And there's no way you can squeeze into this room. There's no way you can squeeze into this earth. There's no way you can squeeze into this universe. But Lord, pour in anyway and do what you want to do, we ask in Jesus' name.